Before we get started, one quick announcement um, that hopefully all of you are clued in about. Uh, the biology department lecture series is happening every Thursday from noon to 1 in 107 SB1. Um, this week, I'm probably going to completely trash your name, Harish Mukha from University of Washington is going to be talking about transcription and translation and basically how they're sort of competing with each other. It should be really fabulous. Um, I've heard nothing but good things about her work and that she gives a great talk. I have yet to hear and I'm looking forward to meeting with her tomorrow as well. So tomorrow from noon to one and I will be sure to actually post the flyer. Some of you may have seen it around SRTC already as far as that's concerned. So um, today just wanted to start out with finishing some of the structural stuff and the classification things that we talked about last time, but also a little bit of a review. Um, the basic message with structures is that, yes, they're icosahedral. They're absolutely beautiful. I brought a couple of my models today. If you want to try and figure out T numbers with some real virus models, I um, brought some of those. Basic message here, again, is it's a simple mechanism. Um, icosahedra are very similar to spheres, and the packaging, even for the really, really big ones, like Mimi virus, is still using that same kind of icosahedral symmetry, but just adding more and more of the hexameric subunits to it. Classification-wise, we talked about the Baltimore classification, um, which is based on Mwagi what? Guy Moi, Guy here, no, Colette Lynch, yeah, it's based on the messenger RNA, exactly, how you get to that messenger RNA. So um, that's the, really the Baltimore classification, also what gets packaged inside the virion. Um, the International Committee on Taxonomy of Viruses, these guys take that kind of RNA and particularly what's being packaged. They also, and I forgot again to bring my book with me, probably because I was feeling too lazy and didn't want to lug it with me. Um, you've got the genomes in terms of the genome sizes, but also whether it's enveloped or not enveloped. And at this point, we've got about 4,000 officially defined species. And we'll see why that's not such a great thing anymore in just a second. Um, and then genomes. Um, that's probably a much better way to classify viruses. The problem with the genomes of viruses is that they don't share a common gene. So it's not like you have for cellular life where everything shares a small cell RNA gene. It's a case of, okay, we need to try and figure out something that all viruses have. What do all viruses have, Devin, Joseph? Man, a bunch of people not here today. Um, Rachel Malam, again, I'm trashing names here. Yes. So the question is, what do all viruses have? Even they don't have, they don't have a conserved sequence, but what does every single virus have? It's got nucleic acid, so you can compare genomes, right? Mm -hmm. Proteins of some kind. What did Patrick Forter use to? define viruses. You had ribosome encoding organisms and what? Capsid encoding organisms. So the structure. And so structure is a way that people have also started to think about ways to classify viruses. And this is where we finished up last time, was looking at these particular structures. And so I talked a little bit about my second favorite virus, STIV, the structure of the major capsid protein has this double jelly roll structure. Um, and I forget if I brought my, I didn't actually bring those models today, um, of these double jelly roll structures. But the double jelly roll is not just present in STIV, which infects archaea. It's also present in viruses which infect bacteria, viruses which infect algae, and this one down here is actually a really fascinating virus that we'll talk about a little bit later on. Um, I gave an outreach talk with OMSI yesterday. One of, my, one of the students asked me, um, can viruses infect viruses? And this is actually one of those, the virus that infects viruses. Um, also has this double jelly roll. None of the sequences here are similar at all. You can't make a phylogeny out of the sequences of all of these things. But 
you can make a phylogeny out of the structure. And this is going all the way back to Linnaeus, when Linnaeus was classifying all of his plants, you know, different sizes and shapes of different things. Well, we've kind of gone all full circle in terms of thinking about virus structures in order to weigh, think about how we can classify different viruses and how they're all related to each other. This is a nice review on the ICTV's idea on how we should classify viruses. Starting on the inside, these are those Baltimore classifications based on what is packaged and then how you make the messenger RNA, so double-stranded DNA, single-stranded DNA, single-stranded RNA positive strand, single-stranded RNA negative strand, double-stranded RNA, double-stranded DNA that goes through reverse transcriptase step, and single-stranded RNA that goes through reverse transcriptase step. Then you have all of the different kinds of organisms that are infected here. It's a little hard to see, but these are now the bacteria. Here are the archaea, et cetera. So it's the shape of the capsid and the <clears throat> part of the genome, and then to some extent the genome, or it says the state of the genome in terms of what kinds of genomes you have, and then the <clears throat> actual structures of the capsids. So they're really into the capsid structure, but here in the overall capsid structure, not zooming into the individual capsid structure. So any questions on this kind of classification? Yeah. Mm -hmm. Not relying on the cell, just look at sort of how related they are. Mm -hmm. How do you differentiate convergence from convergence? Kind of from the DNA. Yeah, so the question is just to repeat is how do you do, uh, separate potential convergence from um, some kind of linear descent? And you could also have horizontal gene transfer, which could be happening, which would also mess things up as well. And the answer is it's really hard. And <laughs> we don't have. Part of the problem is we don't have a very good handle on how structure evolves, and certainly at a protein structure level. And that's one of the big questions that we need to try and answer in order to try and figure out exactly how these things would work. Other questions? Yeah? Okay, so the basic question is, uh, again, I'll paraphrase, you know, how up to date is this? Because this is from 2005 and we're, what, 13 years later, <laughs> basically. Um, those are going to be the next things that I'm just about to talk about. So we'll, we'll get back to that. These are, um, if you look at the notes, you'll notice I have references from 2018 already in there. So um, we'll talk about up to date in just a sec. Okay, you don't have any more questions. I have a question for you. So everyone can get out their clickers and I need to get mine out as well. That makes two of us. And so again, we'll do this um, the new way that I do clickers. Everybody vote. And you have a minute to decide. And then you have a couple of minutes to talk to your neighbors about it. And then we go back and vote again. A. Hey, hey. It sounds like at least the people up front have decided what they wanted to vote on. So uh, go ahead, chat with your neighbors, um, decide what you voted on, and whether you want to change your mind. You ready to vote again? Yeah. Yes? Okay. Let's give it a try. See if we get any changes. Do you get points for doing 
just voting, or did you get points for being right? <laughs> I figured I actually get points for getting wrong. No. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> no, I only I only give you points for getting the correct answer. Um, I will be posting afterwards, um, and hopefully everyone will be able to see then if your clickers are working. If you still have a zero score then and you've gotten it correct one of the reasons hopefully we can get everybody to get correct answers, <laughs> um, then you should see a point. But if, if you have zero points, it might be that your clicker isn't registered or that you um, haven't answered correctly yet. Um, I don't, but they're in the library. You could have checked one out before class. <laughs> now, I put all my extra clickers in the library. Sorry. So that's why. <laughs> Um, so we actually did get better scores the second time around, believe it or not. So what do we people think? Um, now, for extra credit that I'm actually not going to give anybody, uh, <laughs> what is the largest genome known so far for viruses? I, didn't, I did not tell you about this. No, this is the Pandora virus genome, I think, is the current record holder. Um, which is at a little over 2.5 million base pairs in size. Okay, base pairs tells you something already, right? It's double-stranded, so there's no other double-stranded on there, so it's got to be double-stranded DNA viruses. Um, what about the smallest ones? What are those? So the the single-stranded DNA viruses. I should have gone down my list and put somebody on the spot. Um, but <laughs> that's okay, I don't have to do that, not this time. Okay, so <clears throat> yes, so the double-stranded DNA viruses, and I heard some people muttering up front here about the double-stranded DNA being much more stable, um, and that's probably why you have these double-stranded DNA viruses with the largest genomes. You also have really good proofreading for DNA, whereas you don't have very good proofreading for RNA, and we'll talk a lot more about that later on um, in the course. Yeah, Jacob. The smallest ones, these are single-stranded DNA viruses. Um, it seems every time I open the literature, I see a smaller one. <laughs> so they're actually below two kilobases at this point. I think I saw one to 1.9. Like, is it like a polyoma or is it a pox? Oh, these are the circoviruses and yellow viruses, genomoviruses. Um, let's see. Um, we're about three slides ahead of ourselves. So we'll look at this in just a second because they're, the diversity there is, is really amazing. So, okay, close this, and, oh, no, wrong way. It's not C. The answer is really not C, not these single-stranded RNA viruses. There we go, show results. Eventually, I remember how to do this thing. So, <clears throat> following along with the question that we had earlier about where do we are, where are we right now? That was 2005, the virus sphere. Now, um, 2016, 2015, and 2018. Almost all of the new discoveries, or certainly the vast majority of new discoveries in terms of new viruses, and particularly new virus genomes, doesn't come from isolating virions and infecting hosts with them. And so what this does, it cuts out that whole middle ring of the, um, well, to some extent, cutting out the whole middle ring of the ICTV, the virus sphere, whatever the hosts are. Now what people do is they just go and look at genome sequences. And this particular, this first study, uh, where they literally just went to the database. This is a, a meta-metagenomic study. So just looking at all the databases, trying to find sequences that look like viral sequences. And they did that. They found 125,000 new virus genomes, just in published data sets, 125,000 new virus genomes. Um, there's another paper that came out a little Earlier than that, um, from Simon Roux, who's a good colleague of mine, um, they went and looked for viral genomes in a smaller set of data, and they had this neat software tool, which they call Virusorter. I reviewed the paper. I thought it was really cool, and so I said they should publish it. Um, they had 12,500 new proviral genomes. These were actually complete genomes that were in bacterial genomes. And so literally just screening through all these bacterial genomes, with this new software, and they found that they had all of these new sequences. And then most recently, and this was published just a couple of weeks ago, there was a group based out of Australia 
who went and were looking specifically at poorly sampled vertebrate genomes. So they looked at hagfish, they looked at lungfish, they looked at various ray fin fish, and just got all of the transcriptome. So a transcriptome is the RNA which is being made, and so this is, is would you assume, as an RNA, the, all of this stuff here, the proviral genomes, these are in double-stranded DNA genomes, they're probably also going to be double-stranded DNA viruses. Here with a transcriptome, you're looking at all of the RNA. And so the RNAs here are presumably now from RNA viruses, which are actually infecting those organisms at the time that they got the RNA from them. And in this process, they found 250 new virus genomes. And people had thought, and I've actually had to rewrite some of my lectures based on the study that came out here, because um, one of the things that we always say is orthomyxoviruses, flu viruses, they infect um, only you know, birds, pigs, and humans. Well, actually, they also infect lungfish and um, a number of other organisms, too. So um, really fascinating. And this also goes to show that when I talked about viruses infecting everything way back in the very beginning, first lecture, I mentioned that the vast majority of people who study viruses study viruses that infect one species of primates and a few that study viruses that infect crop plants. But in terms of the vast majority of other viruses, even among animals, very little has been studied looking at these. There's actually some really cool studies and now viruses of mosquitoes um, that are important in terms of infecting us, but also just in terms of making mosquito sick. Yeah? Might be a really stupid question, but um, in terms of making like a phylogenetic tree of viruses, could you not go and basically do it backwards from how they studied based off of the um, genetic makeup of what they infect and what they can't infect, and then go evolutionary-wise on what things have evolved based on what they can actually infect and what they can't infect? So if I, under, I, understand, I, understand, I understand your question. No, it actually, it's, it's, I, I had a slide like that in one of my lectures, and I took it out. <laughs> so um, the, basic, the basic question is, is can you sort of backtrack? Because all of these viruses, as we've talked about before, they're dependent on a host. You have to infect a host. And can you use those hosts to learn something about the classification of the viruses? That works really well if you have, and we haven't talked about this too much yet, really narrow host ranges. And that means that one virus only infects one very specific species of organism. Um, the mosquito virus is actually a really nice example of how this doesn't work, because you have viruses like dengue, which will infect mosquitoes and humans. Okay. It's only, it only has an actual effect on humans. It doesn't really affect the mosquitoes. There's a, there's a host effect during So the, the, the question there really brings up Sorry, the, the question is just to repeat it here, is that, you know, oh, it's just making the humans sick. Shouldn't we be interested in just what's the humans? If anything, the humans are a dead end in that case. Mm -hmm. And so probably the reservoir and where you have the virus normally replicating, that would be the one that's most interesting to look at. But nobody looks at things that don't make a disease. And it's actually really hard to figure out what the reservoir species is for lots of viruses. Ebola, for instance, people are still arguing what the reservoir species is for that. SARS, people argue about that. Um, so there are still, I think, some very open questions about that. And it also turns out that you can have multiple viruses infecting the same species, which have completely different phylogenies and genetic makeup. So, um, and humans are a great example. If you look at flu versus smallpox, practically no relationship <laughs> whatsoever with each other. Very, very different viruses, but they're both infecting us. So um, unfortunately, it's a, it's, a, it's a great idea. And there are some affiliations with different groups, but nothing that's really nice and clear for using that way. Yeah, Jacob. The main, uh, uh, sorry, so main reclassification schemes that they use, that these teams use to figure out what other people couldn't figure out in the past? Because they're just going over old data, right? So a lot of these um, are going over old data. And what they've done is they found new sequences and are going back and reanalyzing the old data. And so that's one process. They also have much better software tools for doing some of these studies. And so that was the virus order that Simon Roux um, worked out in terms of getting that to work. Um, so it's new software tools. The other thing is that the amount of data, and 
I forget if we talked about this in any of my other classes, some of the other classes you've taken. The amount of genomic data, which is filling up the databases, um, is ridiculously insane. And so going back and doing analyses like these is actually extremely useful because people are throwing up new genome sequences all the time. Okay, so another way that people are looking at this, and this is from a paper in 2017, um, also work of Simon Roux and Matt Sullivan. Um, what they did is they took advantage of an experiment that I really want to do is sail around the world on this nice sailboat and collect samples every you know, couple hundred miles. Uh, actually, I think it's probably pretty boring <laughs> in the middle of the ocean to be collecting all these samples. But basically what they did is they collected all these samples and just filtered them found the small stuff, the virus-sized particles, and sequenced everything that they found there. And then they compared it to what they knew of actually some of the hosts. And so they did some analyses basically looking at how frequently you find sequences in the hosts, how frequently you find the sequences of the viruses, and you could identify where a few, and that's what all the colored dots are here, these virus populations infected. Um, Unfortunately, you'll probably notice that there are a whole bunch of gray dots. <laughs> Even some gray dots that are some of the most prevalent viruses that you find in the oceans, um, and I should say virions here because we don't know what their hosts are. So the most prevalent virions here, we have no idea what they infect. This is, you know, 40% of the time in any given sample from anywhere in the world's oceans, you find this virion genotype. What's this infecting? We really don't know. And so there's a huge amount of unknown hosts for all of these virions that you find, again, those little dots that we talked about right at the very beginning for nucleic acid stain. Yeah? Um, did, they sample at different depths for this did they sample at different depths for this experiment? In this case, they did, but not a huge number of different depths. It was relatively close to the surface because the sailboat was relatively small and <laughs> they couldn't go down quite so far. But in the few cases where they have gone down to depth, you've seen very similar kinds of data. So it's, you know, again, the, the basic sort of take home message here is there's a heck of a lot that we really know almost nothing about. Yeah, Jacob. Uh, the viral sequences are so different and you're doing like all of the DNA, that all those points represent all of the DNA is coming from like, you know, just one sample or just a couple samples. How are you How is it not like 512 known and other? Like you have all this other DNA. Okay, so the question is basically oh, what, what are all of these you know, slightly under 15,000 new virus populations? How do we know they're new different virus populations? Is because those sequences are different from each other. Okay, so the question, I'm going to paraphrase this really quickly, is isn't the sequencing technique then determine on how independent each of these things are? And so almost all of these sequences, the 15,000 or so, um, are actually not just pieces of DNA. They're pieces of DNA that have been able to assemble into contiguous sequences. And I forget how big these particular ones were, but I think they were on the order of 10,000 nucleotides. So they're pretty clearly, um, and they also have multiple hits to them. So they have multiple sequences that all match those individual sequences. So, but if anything, and getting back to your point here, it's probably an underestimation, actually, of the diversity which you find there. And so these are all of those different virus populations. And they did a pretty conservative cutoff in terms of different virus populations. So I think it was something like 10% you know, sequence similarity gives you a different virus population. And one of the other things they found, this is getting back to, I forget whose question it was about the smallest uh, DNA genomes, um, has to do with another part of the study that they did, which is now looking at these viruses that we call CRESS DNA viruses. Um, horrible acronym, but it's a circular rep encoding single-stranded DNA virus. Eh, okay, but it's these small DNA viruses that, as it turns out, you find in almost all of these samples that people were looking at. And then you can do phylogenetic trees where you compare all of these sequences to each other. And then you can see where the 
sequences are that we know about. So these are the genomoviruses, these are the Gemini viruses in these colored triangles. Um, here's some nanoviruses, some alpha satellite viruses, and some circoviruses. The take home message here is that that's only an extremely small amount of the diversity, which you see in these small circular DNA viruses. Some of them are really, really small, but it's just a sequence. Is it a real virus? Is it not a real virus? So this brings up the whole issue of how do you classify a sequence? And is it really a virus? It's a small genome, but is it really a virus? And we have exactly that problem in my lab right now. We have this wonderful virus genome that we don't know what it infects. And we're very interested in trying to figure out what that is in terms of determining it. But the take home message again here is that there's massive amounts of virus diversity. Those 4,400 that the ICTV recognize is definitely a massive underestimation of the number of viruses which are present in the environment. There are other ways of looking at virus sequences. This is just looking at virus protein sequences. Um, and the message here is it's a mess. Um, we've got all of these things, and many of them aren't related to anything else. If you've got a single line going from the middle of your phylogenetic tree all the way out to the end, that means that nothing is related to any of these sequences. So um, it's almost a completely filled circle here. These branches mean that you know, all of these sequences here were related to this sequence back here. But basically, you know, really crazy. And then just to finish up with these um, recent papers, this is the one which I mentioned where they went through now understudied vertebrates and sequenced the RNA which you found in them. These are the various different viruses that they found. These are the different hosts. In fact, they didn't look at mammals and birds because they said, you know, too many people have looked at mammals and birds already. This is the number of various species. So look, you know, mammals, 1,300 plus virus species. How boring. And mammals are just a really small proportion of the animals on our planet. Birds, about you know, 120 so different virus species. But now if you look at some of these other deeper branching organisms, amphibians, lungfish, and all the way down to the lancelets, which I actually never heard of until I read this paper, uh, but um, very, very basic vertebrates, and then the jawless fish with their lampreys, et cetera. Um, and going through this whole process, you find all of these different kinds of viruses that nobody had ever thought was in these environments before. And where was my, here's the rheoviruses, mixoviruses, where's my flus? Yeah, influenza virus, for instance. So this influenza virus here, we used to think, again, it was just um, in mammals and birds, but no, um, you find influenza virus in a number of, let's see, which of these, forget which one, it's actually it's not on this particular figure, but um, I think they found these influenza viruses in lungfish and in ray fin fish. So clearly a lot wider host ranges for these virus families than anybody thought. So more questions on this. Uh, the, it's going to be really hard to write exam questions on these things. Oh darn, shucks. Uh, basically take home message is ridiculous amounts of diversity and anything I tell you is probably going to be proved wrong the next time I open my email and look at the latest data. So now let's roll back a little bit and finally get back to what stuff is in our textbook, which is also kind of out of date. Uh, but these are some, again, very general ideas about viruses and how viruses go through their replication cycle from virion to making more virions, and a lot of that has to go on inside the cell, so any virus has to do this. It's got to find the right cell to infect and get into that cell, and that's what we're going to concentrate on for the rest of the lecture. These again are generalizations. Finally, we're going to start to talk about real individual viruses um, starting on Friday. So what are the key sort of, oh, key concepts is taxonomy. We already talked about that. Um, for entry, uh, receptors. Virus receptors are the cellular macromolecule that a virion is going to interact with. So turns out they're basically anything that's on the surface of a cell, a virus has evolved to interact with. So it could be carbohydrates, could be proteins, could be lipids. 
basically sort of you name it. Most viruses interact with protein receptors, and so we'll concentrate on talking about some of those protein receptors. A lot of viruses are enveloped, and as we'll see, actually an enveloped virus has a lot easier job getting inside a cell than a non-enveloped virus. All it needs to do is have the membrane around the outside of the envelope fuse with some cellular membrane, and then the genome, or the nucleocapsid, is being released. Um, that process is called encoding, and we'll look at that. Transport is really important for viruses which replicate in the nucleus, as opposed to viruses which are going to replicate in the cytoplasm. Usually where the virus enters a cell is not where it's going to be replicated. So that transport process turns out to be really important. And then if we get a chance at the end, we'll talk about some of the antiviral drugs that people are using for this process. I mentioned that enveloped viruses are easy in terms of this entry process. And it really has to do, let's just look at the top here. If you have a infected cell, it's made a nucleocapsid, that gets an envelope put around it as it buds out of the host cell, that can then go and find another cell, these two membranes fuse, you've released your nucleocapsid inside the next cell. So this is a pretty straightforward process because membranes fuse, that's what happens with membranes. They're actually pretty good at undergoing fusion. There are a number of cases of viruses, and again, we'll talk more about these later, where you have envelopes that are picked up from different intracellular membranes and not the extracellular membrane, and usually these end up actually having two membranes around them inside the cell. This second membrane fuses with the cytoplasmic membrane, releases this enveloped particle, and it then gets picked up by another cell through receptor-mediated endocytosis that gets you into a new membrane compartment. This viral envelope fuses with that membrane compartment, and the virus is actually released. So I like to look at this through a video rather than looking through me sort of talking about it. This is an example from another textbook, but I quite like it here in terms of looking at how you have virus entry that takes place, not just for enveloped viruses, but also from naked viruses. Here's an enveloped one, and we'll just take a look at how it's interacting with the cell. We have, let's play, or is it actually going to play, or are we not going to play? Uh, here we are. So here's our host cell membrane. Here's the enveloped virus. We've got our glycoproteins. They interact with the receptors, these red things, and you have membrane fusion. Now the nucleocapsid is inside the cell. This can now be translated, replicated, etc. So here's this process where you have now, instead of the fusion taking place at the plasma membrane, you have an endosome which is formed, and then you have fusion here inside the endosome and releasing the virus particles. So easy for these enveloped viruses because all you're talking about is getting membrane fusion. On the other hand, if you have a naked virus, this can be picked up again by this receptor-mediated endocytosis, but now somehow this needs to break out instead of through membrane fusion, and look, it magically disappears. It would be nice if you could actually get the membranes to magically disappear, and then release your genome. And so we'll talk more about um, how each of these things um, does their job <clears throat> later on. So we can go back continue with this presentation. Um, so first step is going to be interaction with the receptor. Finding a virus receptor is often one of the first things that virologists do when they identify a new virus, is trying to figure out how that virion can associate with a particular host cell. And these are a number of different receptors that have been found for different viruses. I don't expect you to remember all of the names for these, um, but a couple of sort of common themes should come up here. One of these is this kind of, you know, funky horseshoe-like structure. Um, let's see, where are we at? Um, 
Rahel Malam, any idea what this is? Is Rahel here? Oh, that's all right. See, I got to check these things off. There you go, exactly. That's good. Adam Sukumo. Suk yeah. So these uh, structures actually represent immunoglobulin like folds. And so, why immunoglobulins? What do immunoglobulins do? They're part of the immune system. Adam, yeah, go ahead. They bind to stuff. Exactly. So they've already evolved to bind to things. So viruses evolve to bind to things that like to bind to things. Not surprising in the least. So they have figured out that got something that binds, you can use it. So all of these guys, HIV receptor, polio receptor, adenovirus receptor, all of these have these so-called immunoglobulin-like folds that are associated with them. So that's one classic. Another one, are these proteins called integrins. Why do you think they are called integrins, Jed Acott? Jed here? Yeah. Uh, the question is why they're called Yeah, why do you think they'd be called integrins? Um, probably because they integrate things together. They also like to integrate things into cells. So again, not surprising, viruses have evolved to use these things to come inside the cell. Now, the next um, thing I forgot to mention is that these are not evolved by the cells so that viruses can infect them. That's not terribly surprising. <laughs> these are surface molecules that the cell needs for some kind of function. And usually, these are functions that are absolutely required for the cell, which makes sense from the virus's point of view, because if the cell can get rid of that receptor, then the virus can't infect that cell anymore. So the, it seems that you have evolution of the virus. Now, almost always, these are going to be your glycoproteins and the enveloped viruses or some part of your naked virus on the outside that's going to interact with this particular receptor. Yeah? Um, for the CD4 receptor, mm -hmm. So the question is, yeah, the CD4 receptor is on T cells. Yes, it is exactly the same thing. So it's that same receptor. I was reading a paper about there's a small population in Europe that they don't have these receptors on their T cells, and they're basically immune to the cells. Okay, so the, the question is here, there's um, read about some of these, um, some patients, actually particularly in, well known as the Berlin patient um, in Europe, well, in Berlin. <laughs> <laughs> who is resistant to infection by HIV because he's missing a receptor. So that actually is a great lead-in to what I also wanted to talk about. Um, this person, the Berlin patient, I've forgotten his name, um, he's actually done some, some really nice work. He's been very helpful with the scientists in terms of helping out figure out HIV infections. It turns out his T cells have CD4. If they didn't have CD4, they wouldn't function as T4s. On the other hand, what he doesn't have is this co-receptor right here. Um, and so it turns out for HIV, there are two different kinds of co-receptors. So what's a co-receptor? A co-receptor is another protein that that virus needs in terms of being able to enter into the cell. And it's true for actually not that many viruses, but there certainly are a few that you need these co-receptors for. Um, and it seems that those co-receptors are not always absolutely critical. And so that's the case that happened with, with HIV here. Um, and for a number of other viruses, again, adenoviruses, they need this other co-receptor. Um, there are a few receptors which actually have been named based on the virus that binds to them. This is the PVR, is the poliovirus receptor. It's now known that it's actually important for all kinds of other things in the, things in the cell. The Coxsackie and adenovirus receptor was also originally discovered because it was a receptor. Much later on, we figured out um, what it does. Um, CDC 40, sorry, CD46, again, is one of these immune um, system or immune cell, actually cell surface molecules. Um, measles virus binds to that. So many of these different things, and mostly they're going to be involved in binding to something on the outside of the cell in their normal function, bringing it to the inside of the cell. Yeah, Jacob. So, uh, 
the, the question is, are they using what? Humanized mouse models in order to figure out what receptors are, are being bound to? Um, the answer is usually they don't quite go so far. <laughs> um, but the main thing that people are doing right now is they're doing CRISPR-Cas screens where they knock out every gene in the genome and then find the cells that are not being infected. No, in just in in cell culture models, oh, okay. um, for the most for the most part, um, it's hard to make a mouse that's knocked out in every single gene. Um, but you can actually now, given CRISPR technology, you can actually knock out every single gene in a cell and then screen all of the cells and find the ones that are not being infected. So the ones that you don't have an infection going on with. It's a really amazing technology. Basically, it has to do with massive amounts of sequencing and then bioinformatically separating out the ones that you don't see um, in your screen. Really cool. I can send you some, some information on that. It's a really fascinating process. So <clears throat> the next thing that I wanted to mention is this slide. You're going to see this particular picture many times through the rest of the course. It's basically everything you need to know about virus entry <laughs> for almost all of the viruses we're going to be talking about. So again, we'll be revisiting this um, multiple times. Um, up at the top, <clears throat> we have HIV. This fuses at the plasma membrane. The nucleic capsid gets brought to the nucleus where it gets replicated. Flu is an enveloped virus that comes in through endosomes, fuses in the endosomes. Adenovirus is a naked virus that interacts with that adenovirus receptor that we just talked about, um, gets into the endosome, and then gets released from the endosome, and the degraded, partially degraded virus capsid gets brought to the nucleus, replicated in the nucleus. Herpes virus actually looks a lot like adenovirus, only it's enveloped. The nuclear capsid is brought to the nuclear membrane, and the genome is replicated there. Why would you think that things like adenovirus and herpes virus are going to have to get to the nucleus? Who's next on my list? Sung Jo Shin, more or less properly pronounced. I was pretend, pretend that you, you know, weren't here because I you know, mispronounced your name, but I have your clicker score, so I'll know if you actually are here or not. <laughs> <laughs> mean, yes. <laughs> so much for that idea. Uh, <laughs> Catherine Vu? No. Nathaniel Brown. Or, yeah. So the question is, why do you think that adenovirus and herpes virus need to get transported to the nucleus in order to replicate? Why do they have to be brought to the nucleus? Uh, they need the the, and why do they need the cellular machinery in the nucleus to do it? Uh, Um, to some extent, that is true. They don't have the enzymes to make those, those proteins. But importantly, it has to do with the genome. What kind of genome do you think these are? They're both DNA genomes. And so where is the DNA replicative machinery? And so is in a nucleus. So those have to be brought to the nucleus. We'll talk about why some of these RNA viruses have to be brought to the nucleus um, later on. Much more interesting question. Um, there are a number of particularly the RNA viruses, that never get to the nucleus because they don't need to get to the nucleus. They can all replicate in the cytoplasm. Yeah, Jacob. Are those double-stranded or single-stranded DNA uh, viruses? These are all double-stranded okay. um, DNA viruses. Yeah. What's the importance of the microtubules? What's the importance of the microtubules? It's basically the microtubules is how these virus particles are being transported to the nucleus. And just like all the receptors, which are regular virus proteins, the transport that happens of these viruses, transport wasn't developed in order to move virus capsids around inside the cell. <laughs> it was developed to move other things that needed to be moved around inside the cell. And the viruses have just taken over that process in order to be able to use them. Yes, in the back. Yeah, that's right. Yeah, so the question is, are there some antivirals that focus on disrupting microtubules so you don't get this transport? Microtubules seem to be really important just in general for the cell, and so you have to be very careful about balancing those between each other. And, and that intracellular transport process is 
pretty non-specific B-dianines and kinesins, which you need for all kinds of other things. Um, and this actually brings up a really good point about antivirals, is if the cell is using normal cellular machinery to replicate the virus, you've got to be very careful about your antivirals that they don't mess up the cell. So the question is basically, where are the microtubules inside the cell? That's cell biology. I don't teach cell biology. No. <laughs> um, most of the microtubules do seem to actually be emanating from the nucleus. But again, exactly how the transport works in some of these cases is a question that I don't know the answer to. I think some people do, but I don't particularly know the answer. There's a really cool, I'm sorry I'm getting a little aside here, but <laughs> happens. Um, there's this really amazing website and visualization of cells to the Allen Institute in Seattle. You can go to the Allen Institute Cell Explorer website and they have all of these 3D images of cells which have all of the microtubules labeled in them. This is our amazing. Absolutely incredible. Yeah, so Cell Explorer at the Allen Institute. So that's why we go and look for that kind of question. Yeah. Yeah. So the question, right? So the question is, are there any viruses that are known to basically infect or replicate in mitochondria? None that I know of, but that's probably because the mitochondria is clearly derived from a bacterial system rather than the eukaryotic host that it's in. So it probably would be some kind of bacteriophage that would somehow have to get to the mitochondrion in order to be able to infect it. So I don't know of any, but but technically, yeah, it could be possible. Great study. Make a proposal. Go study it. So, <laughs> so <clears throat> but yeah, so these are, we'll talk much more about these again as we talk about these individual viruses throughout the rest of the term, and I'll try and figure out more about those microtubules. There's some really amazing um, videos of herpes viruses zooming along microtubules, um, and actually happens particularly in neurons. You can see them, you can label the virus particle and see it moving on um, through the cell. Absolutely fascinating process. Um, Hepatitis B virus is another one of these that will get picked up in endosomes, be released from endosomes. Parvoviruses, which are these single-stranded DNA viruses, they get picked up, they get put into endosomes and come out and end up in the nucleus. And then SV40, we'll talk about much later, actually doesn't get picked up through receptor-mediated acetosis. It's a Kavilin process, and again, we'll talk more about that. One of the things that you should hopefully notice here is there are lots of these endosomes. So what's neat about endosomes are particularly interesting about endosomes. Laura Scannell. Laura, yeah. Um, well, I would guess that the viruses that you can think of that are in terms of endosome yeah. yes. is that they have a proplasmic membrane. Mm -hmm. So they, have a, they definitely have a membrane around the outside of the endosome. What happens inside an endosome? Remember what happens inside an endosome as it goes towards the lysosome? Okay. Laura? It becomes more acidic, exactly. And so what would be a really nice thing for a virus to be able to notice? The, the acidic, the pH. The pH changes. So now the virion knows that it's inside an endosome as opposed to on the outside of a cell. When we talked about structure last time, we talked about viruses being in a metastable state. So when it's on the outside of the cell, you want it to be really stable. But as soon as it gets to where it needs to infect, it needs to become unstable. Seeing a change in pH is a great way to do that. And this is actually very well known for lots and lots of different viruses, um, particularly well known for influenza hemagglutinin. So we talked about hemagglutination as an assay just for counting number of viruses. But it turns out that the hemagglutinin is also the receptor binding protein that's present on the virus and is involved in this fusion and release of the genome process. So the hemagglutinin is made as a fusion protein, and we talked a little bit about proteolysis last time. We're going to continue to talk about proteolysis a lot for the rest of the course. Um, made as this single protein that gets broken down into two proteins, HA0 to HA1 and HA2. Um, HA1 at the, here at the top, this binds to the virus receptor, 
Um, for flu, this is interesting. This actually turns out to be a sugar molecule on the outside of cells. That's why um, it's hemagglutinizing those red blood cells. And then under low pH conditions, which are happening when you're in the what, what place in the cell? The endosome, lower the pH, you have a conformational change. And so there's this piece of the protein down here, um, also called the fusion peptide, that completely changes in structure as soon as you change the pH. And this is really quite well known for both influenza, but also for HIV. So let's take a quick look at this um, conformational change that happens with HIV. This is the HIV entry process. This is only part of that. Now you have the fusion peptide. This is after you have the conformational change. Again, do the change in pH. Here we have the cell membrane bound with the fusion peptide, the viral membrane down here. There's a trimer. We've got three of these. This fusion peptide, this fusion peptide is generally very hydrophobic, so it loves to stick into individual membranes. And then we have these other pieces of the protein. So fusion process, what happens? This C-terminal end ends up being pulled up, again, due to a conformational change in the protein. The, everyone always thought, again, we talked about the HC40, that you know, we have very similar kinds of proteins, should have the same kind of structure. Structures change like crazy in these viral proteins. So you have these two parts of HIV, and it turns out that influenza is very similar. Fusion peptides stuck into cell membrane. Now we've got the viral membrane down here. These two need to be brought together. So the first thing that happens is the two membranes get pulled together, and then there's this conformational change that pulls the two leaflets together. You have this hemifusion intermediate, and again, this is all this was this nice linear protein that's now really just completely folded up on itself, and in that process, really pulled these two membranes together. This intermediate is actually pretty unstable, and what it likes to do is have these parts of the membrane fuse with each other, and then when you have a complete fusion, what happens, you remember this is the virus membrane down here, nucleocapsidin genome is here, now we have a hole, um, it can escape and go out into the cytosol and release its genome. Now this process actually gets back to somebody's question here about um, antivirals. Clearly this is a huge kind of conformational change and it's very specific to the virus. It's that virus protein now that is doing this big conformational change and pulling the two together. So this is that antiviral peptide that interacts here and basically what it does is it stops the conformational change from happening. So it's just one of the potential antivirals um, which is used to try and treat, in this case, um, HIV infection. Um, another way that you get virus fusion that takes place is in dengue virus. And I need to skip a little forward here. Um, where we have dengue virus infection. Let's uh, get this one to play as well. Um, now instead of a conformational change pulling these two together, we have a conformational change that happens due to a change in pH, which is changing from a very flat surface to now pointed away from the surface, and then the fusion event happens in a very similar way to what happens with HIV. What I like about this, let's get to here, play, no vaccines, etc. Come on. I had this all queued up earlier, and now it's deciding not to run for me. Okay, well, if it's not going to work, we'll go back and look at our um, keynote presentation. I'll give you, um, take a look at this on YouTube. It's, also, it's basically showing the same thing, but it also releases the genome um, at the very end there. Okay, do we have any more questions on this stuff? So we act, uh, everyone's grabbing their clicker. Good. So we can finish up um, class today talking about these clicker questions. So our second clicker question for the day is this one. So again, you've got a minute to think about it. And then, minute to talk to your friends about it. You can do that later. <laughs> no, what this means is if everybody knows already what the answer is and I get 100%, um, then we just move on and not bother discussing it. Sure, certainly. <laughs> 
allow you to read it. I'm not reading them out loud. I was told it's not a good idea to read them out loud. I'm not quite sure why, but. It looks like we have some differences of opinion, so you probably have something to talk about. So go for it. <laughs> what's the answer? <laughs> but what's the answer and why? Why did you select one of these? Why? Oh, why? Tell each other why you picked that. Because oh, all the other ones are wrong. No. Okay, we ready to vote again? Yes? Are we going to change our minds? been some changes of opinion. Maybe I just give people 30 seconds to guess the second time around. Oh, no, it's not a guess. You now know the answer to the question. That's right. <laughs> confidence. It's a confidence thing. Sometimes. Three, two, one, zero. See, obviously I need to do this more often because we can get 100%, unlike in molecular last time. So um, yeah, so it's really about the, the, the keys to this question are about the fusion of the membranes with each other. And actually getting that fusion is going to be the structural changes that happen in the proteins. And these are specifically going to be the fusion proteins are the proteins that have the fusion peptides. And we'll talk quite a bit. When we talk about nomenclature of viruses, we'll often talk about a F protein. A F protein stands for what? Fusion, fusion protein. Exactly. So um, <clears throat> just finish up talking about how virions and often it's actually just their genomes that are getting into the nucleus. Um, why do you want to get into the nucleus? Well, that's where the machinery is as was pointed out earlier, to get replication. So DNA synthesis and transcription is all happening inside the nucleus. So if your virus is dependent on any kind of cellular machinery for making DNA or for making RNA, that has to all happen in the nucleus. So you need to get your genome to the nucleus. How do you do that? Um, there are a couple of different ways. The nucleus, of course, has a membrane around the outside. Nuclear membrane, nuclear pores. Um, one, sort of the lazy approach to doing this is wait till the nuclear membrane goes away, which happens, of course, in mitosis. If you have a replicating cell, then that nuclear membrane disappears. So nuclear membrane disappears, you're good. So you can be in the nucleus. Turns out a lot of retroviruses do this. They just wait. Wait for mitosis to happen. Nuclear membrane is gone. Nucleus reforms. The virus and the virus genome is there, so you're good to go. 
Um, importance, um, we talked about integrins before in terms of the virus receptors. Importance are those proteins that are important for getting cargo across the nuclear membrane. And viruses, again, have evolved to use this regular machinery for getting the virus genome inside the nucleus. HIV is a really good example of this. It uses these integrin molecules to get in. And question, I think, before, can't you use an antiviral to potentially address this? Will you be addressing then all of the import which would be happening in the nucleus, which is clearly going to be a bit of an issue? Um, many cases, and we talked about the adenovirus and the herpes viruses, these actually have the <clears throat> capsid, which is brought to the nuclear pore. But at the nuclear pore, this capsid is actually too big to get through the nuclear pore complex. <clears throat> so it could wait until mitosis happens, again, like some of these retroviruses do. Or turns out there are signals that this virion detects and disassembles at the nuclear membrane. So it just releases the genome. So the capsid is left on the outside, but the genome is put in. If you have very small virions, sometimes those virions actually can fit through the pore complex and can get into the nucleus as the actual virion, and then get degraded inside the nucleus. This is true for hepatitis B and SV40. Uh, did want to talk briefly about bacteria. Um, as we talked about before, the vast majority of viruses on our planet are viruses that are infecting microbes bacteria and archaea. Um, this case, they also need to get into the cytoplasm. Bacteria are really good at keeping things out of their cytoplasm. So viruses have had to evolve ways to get through these particular membranes. So if you have a gram negative, of course, you've got two membranes. If you have a gram positive, very often has a thick cell wall. Um, and so this, probably some of you have seen before, but I did want to show you this is one of my favorite videos in terms of looking at the virus infection process. This is bacteriophage T4 infecting a poor unsuspecting E. coli. E. coli are in the background. Um, here's the bacteriophage T4. Um, in its process, it also needs to bind to virus receptors. These are the proteins in the virus that associate with the receptors. There's actually two different kinds of receptors. There's the co-receptors here for bacteriophage T4, where you have the co-receptors interact here. And then this amazing syringe structure, which literally compacts and drives the proteins and then eventually nucleic acid through the two membranes of the bacteria. Absolutely amazing process, um, beautiful animation. It's wrong. <laughs> um, and this is what the guy who actually did some of this research told me about, is that um, when it's compacting there, you see that it's, it's rotating around the helical structure. It's in a clockwise form. He says, no, it's actually all anti-clockwise. But when he told the animators, they said, we're not changing that anymore. <laughs> <laughs> so that was the compaction process and how that worked. We'll talk a little bit about some of the antivirals that we already saw that one for HIV. We'll talk a little bit more about those on Friday. And then we'll talk about RNA viruses of bacteria. Fascinating organisms.